Hello everyone, welcome to our Sunday morning service. And if it is your first time worshipping with us online, please send us a greeting. And I pray that the service will be a real blessing to you all this morning. So thank you uh, for joining in. <clears throat> we will be looking later on in the service at Psalm 73. And so this morning I want to read from the book of Revelation, uh, Revelation chapter 22, just to remind us of what lies ahead for uh, believers in Christ. Uh, because there in uh, Revelation 22, we have a preview of what believers can look forward to in the future. So please just listen as I read. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the middle of its street and on either side of the river was the tree of life, which bore twelve fruit, each tree yielding its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations, and there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. They shall see his face, his name shall be on their foreheads, there shall be no night there, they need no lamp, nor light or sun, for the Lord God gives them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. Then he said to me, These words are faithful and true. And the Lord God of the holy prophet sent his angel to show his servants the things which must shortly take place. Behold, I am coming quickly. Blessed is he who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. Now I, John, saw and heard these things, and when I heard and saw, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel who showed me these things. Then he said to me, See that you do you not do that. For I am your fellow servant and your brethren, the prophets, and of those who keep the words of this book. Worship God. And there the angel just corrected John and said, No, I'm just a servant. Worship God. Let us begin with a prayer. Father, we thank you for this call to worship. We thank you for even John the Apostle on the Isle of Patmos. He had that wonderful encounter on the Lord's Day, and we pray that this morning we too might encounter you, our Heavenly Father. We thank you for this blessed hope. Thank you for all that we have read of here in chapter 22 of Revelation. Father, thank you that for the Christian, the future is bright. Thank you that we have a, a, a loving hope, and we thank you that our Lord Jesus has promised that one day he'll return for us. Father, we thank you this morning. And we pray that you would be with us as we worship, Lord, wherever we are today. Lord, we pray that you would draw near. Heavenly Father, please guide us and lead us this morning. May you cause us to be still and know that you are God. And may you also, Lord, so uh, strangely warm our hearts, that we might sing your praises, that, Father, we might hear your word, and that we would be those that would obey your word and give glory and honor to your name. Heavenly Father, we pray you would help us this morning to worship in spirit and in truth. And so we commit this time to you. We pray for wherever your word is proclaimed, Lord, that it will go forth in your power and not return void unto you. We pray you'd bless all who gather for worship in person and even those who will worship online. Lord Jesus, build your kingdom, build your church, and we pray that the gates of hell will not prevail. We pray, Heavenly Father, that there'll be those this day that will put their faith and trust in Jesus as they hear the gospel, the good news of salvation. Heavenly Father, thank you for all your grace and your mercy. And Lord, even as we read there in Revelation, that your coming draws near. Oh, that we would worship as though you would come any moment. So help us, Lord, to keep our eyes on Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Father, thank you for all those who take part. Thank you for the help given to set up these online services. Bless Adrian, Lord. And we pray you'd bless Wendy as she comes and does the reading. Lord, undertake for us this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.
just uh, by way of uh, notices, um, the, the, the prayer meeting will be at 7.30 p.m. on Zoom, and that will be led uh, by Barbara. Also, just to say I'm away for the half term with Lillian and Henry. And so any pastoral needs, please do contact Derek or Barbara. And at the end of the service, there will be a building extension update followed by notices and contact details. And if you have not yet subscribed to this channel, please do by pressing the button that will appear on your screen. Also, do feel free to pass on the links of these services that are online to others so that the gospel can be heard by as many people as possible. And uh, uh, Betty and Malcolm also have, have a notice and they are really thankful for all the prayers, for the cards, for the support uh, and uh, joining them as they uh, celebrated that big wedding anniversary. And so uh, that notice will also appear at the end. I really am glad this morning to have Wendy taking part in the service. So uh, thank you to Wendy, who is now going to come and read from Psalm 73, and then she will lead us in prayer as well. Thank you, Wendy. The reading today is Psalm 73. Truly God is good to Israel, to such as are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet had almost stumbled, my steps had nearly slipped. For I was envious of the boastful when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. For there are no pangs in their death, but their strength is firm. They are not in trouble as other men, nor are they plagued like other men. Therefore pride serves as their necklace. Violence covers them like a garment. Their eyes bulge with abundance. They have more than heart could wish. They scoff and speak wickedly concerning oppression. They speak loftily. They set their mouth against the heavens and their tongue walks through the earth. Therefore his people return here and waters of a full cup are drained by them. And they say, How does God know? And is there knowledge in the Most High? Behold, these are the ungodly, who are always at ease. They increase in riches. Surely I have cleansed my heart in vain, and washed my hands in innocence, for all day long I have been plagued and chastened every morning. If I had said, I will speak thus, behold, I would have been untrue to the generation of your children. When I thought how to understand this, it was too painful for me until I went into the sanctuary of God. Then I understood their end. Surely you set them in slippery places. You cast them down to destruction. Oh, how they are brought into desolation as in a moment. They are utterly consumed with terrors as a dream when one awakes. O oh Lord, when you awake, you shall despise their image. Thus my heart was grieved, and I was vexed in my mind. I was so foolish and ignorant, I was like a beast before you. Nevertheless, I am continually with you. You hold me by my right hand. You will guide me with your counsel, and afterward receive me to glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is none upon the earth that I desire beside you. My flesh and my heart fail. But God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. For indeed, those who are far from you shall perish. You have destroyed all those who desert you for harlotry. But it is good for me to draw near to God. I have put my trust in the Lord God, that I may declare all your works. Amen. Today, I'm going to pray for you, all of you who are listening from the other side of our village to the other side of the world, sitting in your armchair, on your bed, at the dining table, on your own, or with a loved one or friend. So let's pray. Dear Lord, our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love towards us. We thank you for the relationship we can have with you, a relationship that you wanted and you paid the price for, that of dying on Calvary, so we can enjoy an everlasting life with you if we only ask. I bring to you, Lord, the people joining this service today in their own homes who now make up our wider congregation. And especially for those on their own, I pray that you'll take away any loneliness and they'll feel your love surrounding them. Firstly, for the people who love you and just wish they could attend church on a Sunday but can't. 
I pray they'll feel your love for them right now, right where they are, and that they can praise and rejoice along with the rest of your people, that they'll feel a renewed sense of your joy despite their frustrations. For those who are unwell or in pain but wish so much they were in your house worshipping and praising, please, Lord, draw near to them and give them peace and relief from their illness. Also, for those who aren't yet confident enough about COVID to meet with others, I pray that you'll comfort them and that we'll see all of them again soon. Lord, please bless those caring for a loved one whose duties mean they can't lead them to go to church. Perhaps they're even listening to this in the evening because days are so busy. Please give them strength and calm, Lord, especially in the difficult moments. For the elderly, Lord, who dearly want to be in church, but the physical demands of it are just too much, I ask, Lord, that you'll give them an overwhelming feeling of fellowship with the rest of the church, for peace and a knowledge that you'll care for them in this quieter time of their lives. I also want to pray for those listening today who don't know you as their saviour, for whom a service at arm's length is a little more comfortable. Perhaps they're interested in you, but don't want their friends to know, or even may have unhappy memories of church from years ago. I pray that you'll be with them as they listen to your word today. May it spark an increased interest in you, Lord, so they'll want to know more, which will lead to them putting their lives safely in your hands. May they have a sense of your never-ending love wrapping around them like a warm blanket. So have your hand upon our pastor today too, Lord. Use him to bring your word to us, and may we have listening ears and receptive hearts to hear what you want to say to us. We ask all these things in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Holy Father, rich in mercy, Holy Saviour, rich in grace, great in glory, everlasting, I, I long to see your face. Lead me to Christ, our risen Savior, shepherd of the weak and lost, author of our great salvation through the power of the cross. Lead from glory into glory, safely held by arms of love, so to dwell with you forever. Bringing praises to our God Giving glory to the Father Giving glory to the Son Giving glory to the Spirit The Blessed Three Destruction fix my eyes upon you, Lord. And when I wander from your safety, when I wander from your truth, draw me back to my Redeemer through the holy fire of God. Giving glory to the Blessed three in one, giving glory to the Father, giving glory to the Son, giving glory to the Spirit, the Blessed three. So 
If you've got your Bible, turn there to Psalm 73. What a, what a wonderful psalm this is, really. Uh, and there's so much that I have learned as I've looked at this psalm again. Notice there in verse 1, uh, Asaph uh, is testifying to a time when he had a faith crisis in his life. And, and, and I thank God that it's recorded to help all who are facing a faith crisis even at this time. Notice Asaph begins by standing true on what he believes about God. Because there in verse 1 he says, Truly God is good to Israel, to such as are pure in heart. Now this is a statement of his faith in God. This is what he knew of God. This is what he believed and saw of God. And, but notice there in verse 2, he tells of how while going through a dark time, he almost lost his confidence in God. He says, but as for me, my feet had almost stumbled. My steps had nearly slipped, for I was envious of the boastful when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. He felt as if he had spiritually come close to the edge of a cliff. I think it was in March, the Daily Mail reported of a couple who with their child pitched the tent on a 300-foot crumbling cliff edge. And this was just the week after landslips hit the area. And fortunately, Coast Guard officers spotted them and acted and warned them of the danger. I remember a similar uh, in, uh, kind of a story of how two men at night found a spot to pitch their tent. And they woke up in the morning only to find that they had pitched their tent very near a cliff edge. Now, you know, in spiritual dark times, watch where you pitch your tent. The psalmist had pitched his tent on the edge of the cliff of unbelief. Then in verse 2, he says, my feet had almost stumbled. My steps had nearly slipped. Why? because he began to judge things by their outward appearance, which is so deceiving. The grass began to look greener on the other side. And notice the psalmist's problem. The psalmist's problem was that he set his mind on things below. He started to look at life through the lens of the world. And it staggered him because he saw the prosperity of the wicked. He saw that they did not care about their death there in verse 4. For there are no pangs in their death, but their strength is firm. He saw that outwardly they seem to have no worries whatsoever. Verse 5, they are not in trouble as other men, nor are they plagued like other men. He saw that they have more than the heart can wish. This earthly prosperity, verse 7, their eyes bulge with abundance. They have more than heart could wish. He saw their irreverent talk towards heaven. There in verse 8 and verse 9. Notice he says, They scoff and speak wickedly concerning oppression. They speak loftily. They set their mouth against the heavens. And their tongue walks through the earth. They had ignorance of God. Verse 11. And they say, How does God know? Is there knowledge in the Most High? And as a result, the psalmist became envious and, and he wonders there in verse 3. He says, for I was envious of the boastful when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. Why the wicked prosper? He, he grapples with the problem of why do the righteous suffer and the wicked prosper? Which when judged from the standpoint of the world, it's unsolvable. How true it is that often when the perceptions of our heart are wrong, our feet are soon to follow. You know, it was so painful that he began to doubt and even question his faith. Then in verse 13, Surely I have cleansed my heart in vain and washed my hands in innocence. The psalmist is raising his hands. What good is it? I've been cleansed of my sin. I'm pursuing a godly life. Yet I, I have all this stuff going on in my life. Whereas look at the wicked. They don't bother and seem to be doing Fine in their unbelief. Then in verse 14, he says, For all day long I have been plagued and chastened every morning. And it is possible that the psalmist's problem is like your problem this morning. 
You're viewing your circumstances through the lenses of the world and are beginning to doubt and question God's word. You're uh, questioning your faith in Him. You know, when Asaph took his eyes off the Lord, he lost his praise and his hallelujahs. He started to slip and stumble. He stopped going to the sanctuary of the Lord and his life became a miserable existence. There in verse 14 I've read, he said, For all day long I have been plagued and chastened every morning. And there we read again in verse 16, When I thought how to understand this, it was too painful for me. And why? Because he was looking at the present and forgot the future. He was walking by sight and not by faith. And instead of looking up for answers, he started looking around. And he started looking from within. You know, envy actually became the root source of his lament. And so there we see the, the problem of the psalmist. But notice uh, the result. Notice the result of this uh, uh, looking um, inward and around rather than looking up. Look at the result of looking with the lenses of the world. There in verse 16 he says, When I thought how to understand this, he said it was too painful for me. In other words, he had reached the end of himself and, and found it too painful to handle. And there are many like the psalmist who Maybe COVID-19 and lockdown has taken its toll on them spiritually. Their faith is being tested. And if, we, and if they were honest, I, I at the end of themselves and it, and it feels too painful to handle. But thank God that the psalmist had not forgotten the sanctuary of God. Asaph remembered the place of worship where the word of God was read and explained and where prayers were made and sacrifices were offered and, and there was communion with God and there was fellowship with the saints. And he says, until I went, for 17, into the sanctuary of God. He says, until I went into the place of public worship, when he was spiritually and emotionally down, he was in pain and at the end of himself, he says, until I went into the sanctuary of God. He says, then I understood the end. You know, the reasons people sometimes give for not coming to public worship are the very reasons that Asaph went to the sanctuary of God. He said, until I went into the sanctuary of God. And it's there that he considered the revelation of the sanctuary of God, which, which like a shining light, it pierced through the darkness of his despair and pain. And he was made to understand the end of the unbelieving. You know, when you get to the end of yourself, make a knot and hang on. Because help is on his way. Help is on its way. Jesus, Jesus. Remember the disciples in their time of despair. And Jesus came. You know, often God works, God's work begins when we get to the end of ourselves. Isn't that what happened with God sending His Son, the Lord Jesus, to be the Savior of the world? You know, the Bible says that even while we were yet sinners, Christ Jesus died for the ungodly. It says God demonstrated His love towards us even while we were yet sinners, Christ Jesus died for the ungodly. He didn't wait for us to clean up, to touch up, or to act up, or shape up. No, He didn't wait, didn't wait for us to get good or get better. But he demonstrated his love. The Bible says in the fullness of time, God's time, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to deliver us from the law. You know, the picture we get there in Romans, we could think of it in the picture of a, of a, of a lost sheep, helpless and scared, in shock and panicking with fear and moving towards a cliff edge. There comes the good shepherd comes to rescue the sheep, but the shepherd doesn't rush to it lest he scares it and it runs off the edge of the cliff. But the shepherd stands back and he watches the lost sheep and he watches it till it has no strength and can only lie down. And only when it is without strength, then and only then does 
the shepherd make his move. He comes to rescue the sheep when it is most helpless. Why? Lest in its strength and panic, it throw itself off the cliff. Romans 5 verse 6 says, For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. You know, we are candidates for salvation when we see our helpless need for the forgiveness of our sins by Jesus alone. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And there, verse 17, he says, Until I went into the sanctuary of God, and then I understood their need. After getting to the end of himself, notice how the entire psalm shifts from Asaph's perceptions to God's truth. <laughs> you know, everything was put into perspective when he went into the sanctuary the place of worship, the place of prayer, and he entered into the presence of God. Now, it wasn't just that he was there physically, which I believe he was, but it was also that he had entered there spiritually. He had entered there in worship and in devotion, and he had come with his heart, his mind, his soul. Because often we can be in the place of worship and yet not be in it with our heart, our mind, and our soul. And there he was. And there in the presence of the Lord, in the, he exchanged the lenses of the world and he put on the lenses of the word, the lenses of God's word. And he clearly saw the whole picture. He saw the end of both the righteous and the unrighteous. And they were completely different endings. You know, modern technology is amazing. Think of a drone and think of someone who's caught in a traffic jam. And the thing about those drones, you can launch the drone into the sky and from above its camera can show you what lies ahead. So caught in a traffic jam, you launch your drone, you can see the reason for the jam. It may be that a lorry has overturned ahead or there is an accident ahead or there are roadworks ahead. You, you can see what is at the end. And in the sanctuary, Asaph gets... A drone view from God of what lay ahead for the ungodly. And friends, it was not pleasant. You see, the Bible says there is a way that seems right to a man, but the end thereof leads to destruction. Now, as if with God's lenses, things are seen in the light of eternity and their true perspective. Do you remember how Asaph felt there in verse 2? But notice how different he is now in verse 23, right up to verse 27. He just so 28, he's very different. He says, verse 23, he says, Nevertheless, I'm continue with you. You hold me by my right hand. He says, you will guide me with your counsel and afterwards receive me to glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is none upon earth that I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Notice how he parallels this experience that he's now having there in verse 23, 28, who he is in Christ, in God, who he is in God. And notice he, he parallels it with the experience, uh, with the plight of the ungodly, the unbeliever. Verse 18, notice what he says. He says, surely you set them in slippery places. You cast them down to destruction or how they are brought to desolation as in a moment they are utterly consumed with terrors. Then in verse 27, he says, For indeed those who are far from you shall perish. He says, You have destroyed all those who desert you for holotry. He contrasts and he compares the godly to the ungodly. And looking through the, the spiritual lens, he now discerns. He discerns that they, they set tent on slippery places. Notice there verse 18, he says, Surely you set them in slippery places, you cast them down to destruction. And here is a picture of those who are right on that cliff edge where, where, which is falling away. And the temporal prosperity of the ungodly that had pulled him down, he realizes is a deceptive symptom of a fatal end. He says one day they will awake in eternity. 
like from a dream and come face to face with their maker and give an account to God who will arise. You see, the psalmist declares that he will met out, met out his, his justice. There in verse 19, oh, how they are brought to desolation as in a moment. They are utterly consumed with terrors. And he will cast them down into hell's destruction and utterly consumed with terror. What a, what a contrast with the godly, with the righteous. And so the quick question is, not where are you in life? But where are you going after this life? You see, this new view of the psalmist actually dries up the roots of envy. After all, who's going to covet the positions of someone who, who, who's made famous for an hour and a fool for a year? You see, the plight of the unrighteous is a complete contrast to the prospects of the righteous. In verse 24, he says, you will guide me with your counsel. And afterward, receive me to glory. You see, the psalmist, having seen the puzzling problem through God lenses, there in verse 20, as a dream when one awakes, so Lord, when you awake, you shall despise the image. You know, he, he he's now setting his, he's set his mind on things above. And, and as he does this year, the psalmist makes several discoveries. Firstly, he acknowledges his own foolishness there in verse 22. He says, I was so foolish and ignorant. I was like a beast before you. Now beasts only just go by what they see and on what they see at face value just on the surface. And, and he says, I was foolish. So he acknowledges his foolishness. But then he's also discovered that, 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 that we can be thankful. For three guarantees from God there in verse 23 to verse 24. Because God guarantees us his presence. In whatever circumstances we face today, Christian, he promises us his presence. Secondly, he, he not only promises us his presence, he, he, he promises his guidance. To guide us through this pilgrim's journey. Oh, guide me, oh thou great Jehovah. Pilgrim through this barren land. You know, he, God has promised it here in Psalm 73. And notice, thirdly, he, he promises heaven. He promises heaven. And all this is what the psalmist was missing when he was looking with the lenses of the world. You know, God guarantees his presence. There, verse 23, nevertheless, I am continually with you. Notice God promises to be with us. His name is Emmanuel, which means God with us. But notice also, he not only do we see in verse 23, nevertheless, I'm coming with you. He says, you hold me by my right hand. That's what the psalmist says. We are grasped by the powerful hands of the creator of the universe. And the good shepherd who anoints our head with oil and, and uh, with his hand and comforts us with his rod and his stuff held in his hand. And importantly, those hands bear scars that speak of sacrifice and love. Graham Kendrick's hymn, Hands that flung stars into space, to cruel nails surrendered. And why? Because he loves you so much that he shed his blood his blood, so that if you repent of your sin and put your faith and trust in him, he will forgive and cleanse you of every sin you've ever committed. And the psalmist says he's reminded, he's reminded of the Lord's presence. He's reminded of the guarantee from God of his guidance. There again in verse 24, he says, you will guide me with your counsel. Jesus sent the Holy Spirit who we were looking at last week who through the, the word of God counsels us into all truth. He guides us. The Holy Spirit empowers us to fulfill the will of God. And so we can pray in the Spirit and be led by the Spirit and we can live by the Spirit and we can walk in the Spirit one step at a time and one day at a time. And the psalmist he knows, he sees that God has guaranteed his presence. God has guaranteed his guidance. And thirdly, he, he, he speaks of how God, the guarantee that he will receive us into heaven. Notice the second part of verse 24. He says, 
He says, and afterwards receive me to glory. Oh, remember Enoch? He walked with God and he was not, for God took him. God received him up to glory. Remember Elijah? God sent those chariots of fire. They received him up to glory. Remember Stephen? While being persecuted for his Lord and Savior, while praying for those enemies, those who were stoning him, he was received as the Lord Jesus stood up and received him into glory. Jesus made a promise in John chapter 14, verse 2 and 3. There he said in verse 1, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And that's when we notice one of the disciples, he said, Lord, we don't know the way. And Jesus said, I am the way the truth and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. You see, if you are not saved from your sin, you are not promised a place in heaven. But if you are saved, then as Christians, we know we are going to heaven because of the price that Jesus paid on the cruel cross. 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 10 says, who died for us that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Oh, what a blessed promise. What a blessed assurance. What blessed guarantees. Nevertheless, I am continually with you. You hold me by my right hand. You will guide me with your counsel and afterwards receive me to glory. But it is God for me, verse 28, to draw near, but it is good for me to draw near to God. I have put my trust in the Lord God that I may declare all your works. Oh, this morning, like the psalmist, can I encourage you to draw near to God? Can I encourage you to put your trust in the Lord God? Can I encourage you to then declare all his great and wondrous works?
Amen. You know, in Colossians 3, we're told to set our mind on things which are above, not on things on the earth. And I mean, I've using the analogy of uh, our, uh, the lenses of the world uh, and how we need to put the, the lenses of the word of God, the, the, the lenses of, uh, of above, from above. Because as Christians, you, you have much for which to be thankful for. And just remember that God promises to be with you in life circumstances, to, to guide you and, and then receive you into glory. Wonderful. You know, when you find yourself becoming frustrated by the world's inequalities, stop. That's what the psalmist is saying there in Psalm 70. Get into the presence of the Lord. Look up and give thanks to God for his blessings. Count them. Count your blessings. Name them one by one. And it will surprise you what the Lord has done. Let us pray. Father, we thank and praise you for you are so good to us in many ways. We thank you, Heavenly Father, that we have all these great and precious promises. Father, we pray that whenever we are tempted, Lord, to be like the psalmist, how they in verse 2, he began to look at life through the lenses of this world. Father, we realize that he became discouraged. Father, help us to view our life through the lenses of your word. Lord, we pray that you'd help us as we take your word to heart. Bless each and every one, Lord, who is listening this morning. Come to each one. Strengthen each one. Encourage each one. Bless and, Lord, build and prosper each one in the things of God. Father, we thank you. Speak, Lord, long after the preacher is silent. For those who don't know you, we pray that they would come to know that you so loved the world and you gave your Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Oh, Lord, that they would be saved. In Jesus' name, thank you, Lord. Amen. Now to him who is able to keep you from falling and to make you stand without blemish in his presence, to the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty. Amen. I want to um, give an update on the uh, on the building work that's uh, taking place um, at Crown Lane, and want to just uh, read a a verse, uh, Psalm one hundred and twenty-seven. Unless the Lord builds the house. They labour in vain who build it. Unless the Lord guards the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. And um, as we've thought about the uh, different projects that we want to carry out at church, um, it's really important to us that this is a project uh, which the Lord will build in our midst. Uh, there are three uh, different projects and uh, you will uh, of course as you uh, if you've driven past church uh, you will have seen this but if you haven't been at church for a while then these uh, pictures will be uh, will be new to you um, this picture here shows the extension at the end of church which is um, for a stairwell and a lift shaft in order to take us up to the space above um, the extension uh, that we're going to use uh, uh, for an office and a meeting room uh, and some other uh, space up there. We'll look at that again in, in a minute. Then we have uh, the um, extension and refurbishment uh, of the toilets. And um, as you can see here, the extension obviously has gone all the way down to the end. So the prayer room has an extension uh, too. Um, and then the, uh, sorry, this the, this picture is showing the inside of the um, the side extension with the staircase and the lift uh, going up to that first floor. And there's another uh, picture of the lift. Um, upstairs is a, a big space, and we are uh, going to be 
having two rooms, an office and, and an eating room, um, and those are these, these two rooms here. So this is one of the uh, meeting rooms, as you can see a large window in there, uh, bringing light in. And then this is the uh, office and uh, there's some storage space uh, in, the, in the wall there as well. This is uh, not finished yet, as you can see, but uh, this is the new ladies' uh, toilets with um, wash basin, uh, two, two wash basins, and then um, three uh, toilet uh, cubicles. Uh, as you can see, the um, the, the tiling um, has been uh, challenging because there's a, a curved wall in the ladies toilet and so we've had to use a slightly different kind of um, tile there. Uh, we have a, a new uh, disabled uh, toilet. Um, again this isn't finished yet, this is the one that we're using in church at the, at the moment. Um, but there will be a full disabled um, unit there. And then we have the men's um, toilets, completely uh, refurbished. And then this is the extension on the um, prayer room. So this will uh, obviously make the room that little bit bigger um, for adventurers and prayer meetings and, and things like that. Then outside we have this um, large brick built storage building. This end um, we're going to be keeping our machines in there, the lawnmowers and various things. And then um, that's just a sort of a close up of the inside space. Uh, the other end is a storage area where we're going to keep the toys um, and spare chairs and things like that. So this, this is a very good um, facility that uh, that we will have um, and then because of the side extension um, the fire exit now can't come around the side of the building so there will be um, a, a gate um, to allow people to come out and go on to um, the road to Crown Lane um, in the case of an emergency those are the the three um, the three projects that we are, are working on, and um, we are hoping that uh, it won't be too much longer before um, we've finished with those. Um, I just wanted to share a few um, prayer points uh, with you. Um, first of all, that um, that we pray for for the safety uh, of the workmen. We know that uh, two of our churches have had accidents um, with workmen and um, where well, they have been injured. And so, you know, this is a dangerous business and we want to pray um, for the safety of the, the workmen. Uh, we have a, um, a, a group, uh, Cameron is the, the site manager, he is the stepson of Mick Bamber, um, who's the son of Mick and Marjorie Bamber. Um, his um, twin brother, uh, Reese, is a joiner, and then we have um, two errands. Uh, one is a, a bricklayer, the other is an apprentice, and then there are various other um, workmen coming on site to do various different things. Um, one of the issues we've had is delivery of materials. It's been a very difficult time with the lockdowns and things like that and we're still struggling to get certain things on site um, and uh, we're, we're currently waiting for materials and we can't finish certain things until we get those. Um, another um, prayer point is the availability of contractors that again has been an issue actually trying to get people in at the times that we need them in um, it's been hard to do that and um, uh, please uh, pray for that. Also please pray for the relationship that we have with the builder and the contractors and uh, we, we think this is a, a very important thing um, that we want to, um, to work well with them. 
We also, of course, want to, uh, if we get opportunity, talk to them about the Lord and um, uh, please, uh, you know, pray for, for that, for opportunities to, to talk to them and do pray that uh, the, the devil, the enemy, won't uh, be able to get in and, um, and cause a, uh, you know, a, a rift between us. We do pray that our relationship will remain good. Uh, and finally, we need a vision for the future use of these facilities we do pray that um, you know we're not just building these things for the sake of it that the Lord will uh, will use these new facilities uh, for his glory